Uh, in case anyone is wondering, my name is Angel Garcia. I am the president of Secular Student Alliance at Arizona State University. Um, and to begin tonight's debate, I have with me right here a Mexican peso. And we're going to do a coin flip on seeing who is going to be going first. Uh, as, as far as the schedule goes, how the debate is going to be hosted, uh, each uh, debater is going to have five minutes to introduce themselves. Uh, they may introduce themselves however they wish, so give general background information on themselves. How they. What is that? It's a big coin dollar. Oh, all right. He has a more interesting coin, so we're going to use that. <laughs> Ooh, this is fancy. Um, it's kind of big, though. Anyway. Um, so the uh, different debaters will be giving background information on themselves. They will be um, offering, you know, how they arrived to their position as a Christian or an atheist, or how they developed their philosophy. Uh, after those five minutes, each uh, debater will have ten minutes to offer their perspective on the existence of God and the meaning of human life. Um, after which, each candidate will or debater will have five minutes each to offer a rebuttal to the other's position. After that, uh, each person will have five minutes to offer counter rebuttals. And at the same time, after that, um, we will have a five minute break. After that five minute break, uh, each uh, debater will have 10 minutes to present, uh, the, uh, represent their argument in light of the rebuttals and counter rebuttals of their opponent. And after uh, that re-representation, uh, the uh, mic will be opened up to the floor and you guys will be able to ask either or, or both debaters questions regarding their positions. Um, so without further ado, let's get this coin toss started. Uh, by the way, uh, hello. Hello. Okay. So, by the way, uh, Mr. David Wood is going to be tails. Uh, Mr. Kyle Jones is going to be heads. would take me. And where it took me is to now not believing in God, 
Uh, I don't just believe, I disbelieve in the Christian God, I disbelieve in Allah, Ganesh, Zeus, uh, Ahura Mazda, um, for those who don't know, that's the Zoroastrian God. <laughs> uh, yeah, I know you guys thought I was Zoroastrian, right? Um, but, um, so yeah, so that's basically where I stand. Um, I'm honored to be here, and I'm really happy to see you all here tonight. And uh, I'm Kyle. Look me up. Most of what I do is not debate. Uh, most of what I do is interfaith work, uh, where I have dialogues and discussions. You know, I'm the friendly, jovial, sort of wimpy atheist. But I can uh, dabble in debating, so that is why I'm here today. So thank you all for coming out, and uh, let's, let's get this going. Thank you. Well, good evening. Um, uh, uh, David, I have a quick question. Are you planning on using a microphone tonight? No, he's not. Okay. He um, says the face. I just rolled one. Gotcha. Um, if, you can pass me, huh? if you can pass me the microphone, so I can use it. Good evening. I'd uh, like to thank the Secular Student Alliance for hosting the debate and coming up with an interesting topic and uh, Kyle for defending the indefensible tonight. Um, I think it's pretty cool giving us uh, five minutes to introduce ourselves, allows us to tell some humorous anecdotes. I have a bunch, but I'm not going to share them. Uh, I thought I'd share a few details since this is leading into a debate. I'll um, give you a little background on how I came to the positions I'll be uh, talking about later tonight. I, uh, Grew up in a lot of places, mostly a trailer park in West Virginia, so the mountains of West Virginia. And so after school, we would go build forts and uh, shoot things with bows or with rifles. And if we were inside, we would uh, play video games, which back then was an Atari 2600, long before uh, most of you probably don't know what that is. Um, and then eventually we got the Nintendo. Nintendo, which was really cool, and uh, we all thought that this was very, uh, very meaningful back then. We built our forts, and uh, we once built a six-story fort out of, uh, out of pallets. We, um, I won an archery competition using my bow, so that was really cool. And um, uh, I defeated the heavyweight world champion, Mike Tyson, multiple times <laughs> in Mike Tyson's punch out. And so uh, all this was, it was was really cool back then, and. Um, but then you know, things start breaking down. Someone, someone tore down that six-story fort we built, and uh, we eventually found one of the kids who tore it down when we weren't there. He got punched in the face several times. He had destroyed our, our pride and joy. And he dropped his backpack when he ran. We threw his books all over the place, and uh, that was like every you know we've been working on that for weeks. And so uh, that's how things were when I was growing up. And of course, years later turned out to think that all those things weren't as important as we thought they were back then. And I'm not giving my perspective now looking back on that. I, I came to this conclusion when I was a teenager that you know, these things really weren't as important as I thought. Um, I never believed in God when I was growing up. I was, I think, around 13 when I realized officially that I was an atheist. Probably a year or two later, I concluded that everything I believed about right or wrong, I believe, because society had manipulated and brainwashed me into thinking it. And uh, probably a year or two after that, I, I concluded that everything is uh, meaningless, at least in an, in an ultimate sense. And that uh, I, I understood most people find what they do meaningful, especially if they love what they do. But I regarded that as, as kind of a, a harmless delusion. I thought um, all we can really do is whatever we feel like doing with the little bit of time that we've got. And that's what I did. The problem is what I, things I felt like doing weren't, um, weren't exactly legal a lot of the time. So I ended up in a couple jails, a couple mental hospitals, a few prisons, and lots of people would be bothered by that. I was a little bit, but whenever I would think, hey, you know, I, I should I feel like I should be doing something else with my life, I would, I would think, why? What's, uh, what's the point of this? You know, I'm going to go to school for 12 years and then go to more school and more school so I can get a job and work 40 years and then retire and shrivel up and forget how to pee and then die. I mean, why, why, what's the point of that entire pattern? Why am I going along with that? I 
why not just sit in prison where I can read all day and people give me food and so on? You know, it's, well, why? Well, why do that? Why, why is one better than the other? And uh, so um, I was in a jail and I met a Christian named Randy. And this guy was the first Christian who actually ever stood up to me when we were arguing. Most Christians would just back down. Hey, we don't want to cause a scene or anything. And um, long story short, after arguing with him enough, I started studying in order to uh, prove him wrong. And I came to believe along the way that um, all the evidence we have tells us that Jesus was dead. And uh, all the evidence we have tells us he was alive again later. And that started looking like a miracle. And in addition to some other things I was studying, I decided the least I could do is, is offer up a prayer. And so I prayed, and uh, when I set up from that prayer, the entire world looked different. Um, everything was suddenly infused with, uh, with a different sense. Everything was suddenly meaningful and purposeful. And so uh, that's how I came to the conclusion I'll be defending this evening. Before we get started today, um, two things I'd like to note, if anyone needs to go to the bathroom or exit the room at any point, uh, I would ask that you guys use the double doors over here and not the single door over here as that would interfere with the video recording. And um, at the same time, uh, each person has a certain amount of time to speak, as I've uh, already said. Um, when they have two minutes left, I will raise uh, two fingers up to let them know. One minute left, 30 seconds, and then finish your sentence, stop. Um, in case anyone is wondering what the hand gestures are for. Uh, so without further ado, though, I'm going to turn the uh, floor over to uh, uh, Mr. Kyle Jones. All right. So let's think about this for a second. We're talking about two things tonight, right? We're talking about the existence of God. Uh, we, we have to dive into what exactly we mean by God there. And we also have the meaning of human life. Okay, so these are two things, two-pronged approach here. So regarding the first thing, the existence of God, we have to usually flesh out what we mean by God. Lots of people mean lots of different things by God. Uh, David here particularly is of the Christian faith, or he identifies as Christian. As we all know, even within Christianity, there's an infinite uh, plethora of understandings of what God amounts to. Um, so, but like I said earlier, I'm an atheist about any God. Um, if you want to describe God as being synonymous with nature, or the universe, or something like a liberal Christian might say, our infinite obligation to the other, I have less of a problem with that, with uh, Einstein or Spinoza's definitions of God. If we're talking about God as an immaterial, invisible, personal, willful being, that exists outside of space and time, I do not believe in that God. And I believe that there is absolutely no evidence. I believe you can have faith, you can want there to be a God, but I do not believe that that God exists. And I have many reasons for that. One of them is when we start talking, when we start describing this God, it gets very difficult. Okay? Like I said, if this God is infinite, then this God infinitely transcends the world. How would we ever understand an infinite God? How would we ever comprehend or wrap our minds around an infinite God? An infinite God would infinitely transcend any word that you would use to describe about God. So, how would we even understand what this God is like? If you can understand infinity, then you are way beyond what I would think of as normal human cognition. Right? If... if if you can understand what quantum mechanics and uh, what astrophysicists have been trying to comprehend for years and years and years, if you're able to even answer their doubts or their questions, then I doubt you. Um, I remember this funny meme. It was like uh, creationism, the belief that Kirk Cameron knows more than Stephen Hawking. <laughs> um, we're overstepping our, our reach here. We're, ta we're trying to describe in human words what an infinite being is. So once again, when we say things like, uh, God spoke, what, what do we mean when we say speak or spoke? We're implying certain things, right? 
We're implying a uh, larynx or a tongue or uh, audible words. How can that be applied to an infinite being? It, it just it simply does not reach. So we're going too far in our epistemologies to assume that the language we use can accurately reflect or grapple or describe even remotely close an infinite being. Right? The closest thing you could ever get to describing infinity would be silence. And so I think that that's probably a more humble position to take than to say that you know that there exists an infinite being outside of space and time. I think that's, uh, it takes a lot of uh, to guts, a lot of guts to say that. Now, lots of people say, well, where does the world come from? I, I love this question. When people ask me this question, well, where do you think the world came from? I'm like, you're talking to me, I'm 33 years old. I, how the hell do I know where the world came from? I mean, really. And whenever anyone says, well, I got an answer right here. I know where the world came from. What are you talking about? How do you know where the world came from? Um, it's a very high and lofty question to ask somebody. Give me the ultimate answer to life and existence. Right? Like I said before, it's 42 would be a better uh, answer than God in my mind. So when I get asked that question... I'm very skeptical. I say I do not know. I'm fine being agnostic about the origin of all things. I think that that is a very consistent and uh, humble approach that we should take. Now, I think some explanations are more viable than others. But if we ask, if we assume that there was a first cause, a creator to everything, the logic then goes, where did God come from? And the answer to this question is, well, God has always existed. But do you see the problem there? That hasn't explained it. All that that has done is posit another infinite, another thing that we haven't explained. We have a hard enough time explaining uh, Big Bang cosmology to take another step and to say, well, there's this whole other infinite thing is to add to the equation. So when um, Napoleon famously asked this old, uh, well, old yeah, couple hundred years, scientist Laplace, well, what about the starry heavens and God and the cosmos? He responded by saying, I have no need of that hypothesis. It doesn't help me explain the way things are. All it does is add something else to the equation. Um, and I think that that's not good for um, for Occam's razor or for trying to find the simplest and clearest explanation for things. Now, there are other reasons I do not believe in God um, besides the epistemology, uh, besides language. Um, it's that this God often reflects too closely people, right? What's more likely? That there is a God who is jealous, righteous, angry, regrets things, changes his mind, gets pissed off, or humans who are angry, jealous, pissed off, fickle, change their minds, projected this onto an invisible being. I think if you had to choose between the two, I think the latter makes a lot more sense. Uh, what was the old Proverbs that um, um, early Ethiopians, God was black? Um, our gods reflect us too much. They reflect our aspirations. These are people describing God. And as we all know, we have to be careful when trusting people. Especially when they try to give us an answer to the ultimate question for things. So instantly, I am skeptical of this idea of God existing because humans are describing this God, and these humans that describe this God have political aspirations, they have motives, they have all kinds of biases. I mean, don't we all? My, I mean, I, if I came up with my God, you know, you, you probably wouldn't want to believe in my God, because my God would be badass. I mean, my God would like my music, my God would like Oscar Wilde, um, my God would be too much like me. 
So, when we examine these gods, look at their attributes. Look at their characteristics. David believes in a God that flooded the world. Now, I'm not sure if you believe in a global flood or a localized flood, but you believe in a God that's killed people. If I believed in a God, a God would not kill people. And I think the God that doesn't kill people is more moral than the God that kills people. Because if I'm more moral than my God, then there's a problem. I had this problem as a Christian. I was like, I've never killed anyone. I've never said that, I've never commanded a group of people to uh, kill someone they thought was a witch. Or to kill a homosexual. Or to ostracize women. I've never commanded that. How can I be more moral than this God? It's, it's problematic. It truly is problematic. Um, so anyway, we'll keep going on with the God question, but that's the first prompt. All right? There's a lot more reasons why I don't believe in God, but I don't have too much time. I only have ten minutes. Oh my God, I only got one minute. <laughs> so let me describe in one minute the meaning of human life. <laughs> Marathon run, everyone. If, I, if, if you believed me that I could explain the meaning of human life in one minute, then there's a problem with you, as there be a problem with me. This is the reason why you should doubt Tony Robbins, or any other uh, snake oil salesman. Okay? I have certain ideas about what constitutes human meaning, but I don't believe in a grand overarching purpose for the cosmos, but I do believe that life is meaningful because it's finite, because it ends. Um, and we'll talk more about that in a little bit. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kyle. Uh, Mr. Wood, you have the floor. I just want to remind you and everyone, though, that we're just presenting arguments right now. Rebuttals will be in a little bit. And you may be All right, I think uh, Kyle and I are off on uh, focusing on different things here at the beginning. I looked at the, uh, the description on the Facebook page that said, uh, <coughs> described the debate as a discussion of the implications of theism and belief in God and lack of belief in God on the meaning of, of life, but uh, I'm, I'm fine um, discussing the existence of God as well tonight. I'm just going to focus on that in my opening statement and then in the rebuttals we can get to uh, details of the existence of God. Now, um, I certainly don't want to argue that atheists don't have meaning in life. Lots of things can be meaningful to us in different ways. Um, the real difference between theism and atheism when it comes to the uh, when it comes to meaning, I would say, is, is the kinds and degrees of meaning available uh, to us. So, by way of analogy, um, if you're a vegan, it doesn't mean you don't have any food, it just limits the range of foods available to you. Um, other people who aren't vegan would have a wider range of foods available to them. Similarly, if you're an atheist, uh, you might find meaning in what you do, but the kinds of meaning available to you are uh, are a bit narrower. I would, I would argue that you're, you know, the kinds of meaning available to you are um, have to do more with, with how you feel about certain things. Um, to examine the differences between theism and atheism with regard to meaning, I think it, it, asks, uh, it helps to ask questions of meaning. In, in other words, questions that, that deal with, with this topic. And uh, there are lots of these. I'll, I'll address six and we'll see how a theist and, a, and an atheist might address these uh, questions. So these would be questions like, what am I? What's my purpose? How did I get here? Where am I going? What am I <coughs> worth? And what's the point? How would atheism and theism lead to different answers for these kinds of questions? So uh, according to atheism, first question, what am I according to atheists? Well, different atheists will give different answers. I'll go ahead and quote Richard Dawkins on this one. In his uh, really amazing lecture, The Ultraviolet Garden, uh, Dawkins says, We are machines built by DNA whose purpose is to make more copies of the same DNA. This is exactly what we are for. We are machines for propagating DNA. And the propagation of DNA is a self-sustaining process. It is every living object's sole reason for living. Um, so, a molecule called DNA, you are a machine designed by that to make copies of it. That's what you're here for. Um, what are you, what would you be according to theism? If we're talking about Judeo-Christian theism, you would be the 
image of God. So there's a God, and you're created in God's image. Second, what's my purpose? What's my purpose according to atheism? Well, if we go with the Dawkins trend, we'd have to say that my purpose is to make copies uh, of DNA. That's my fundamental purpose. I might have other purposes in life. I might do various things, but I would do these things because my purpose is to make copies of DNA. In other words, if I go to school and earn a living and uh, help other people, it's because I'm wired in a certain way or uh, I need the materials to survive or something like this. So these ultimately come back to that fundamental purpose. And so it seems I would be kind of serving a molecule here. What would my purpose be according to theism? Well, again, if we're talking about Christian theism, I would be here as a representative of the creator of the universe. That seems like a, a meaningful task. So on atheism, I'm a representative of a molecule. On theism, I'm a representative of God. Third, how did I get here? Lots of reasons I'm here now, according to atheism, but given what I am, a machine for propagating DNA, the most important reason I'm here is that my ancestors did a better job propagating DNA. They found more food, they had more sex, they um, were better at using a spear against an enemy, they were better at running when they were in danger, and so on. So they were just better machines for propagating DNA than some of the other machines for propagating DNA. According to theism, how did I get here? Well, here again, there are lots of cancers uh, that would be involved in how I specifically got here. Uh, but given what I am, the image of God, the most important reason I'm here is that I was created by God. Fourth, where am I going? There'll be lots of stopping places along the way, but what's my final destination according to atheism? Death, of course. Um, if I carried out my purpose well and I passed on my DNA, parts of the molecules in my cells will continue in other uh, in other human beings for a while. The rest of me will be recycled. My atoms will um, end up as parts of other things. Um, but humanity itself and all life will eventually perish, and whatever is left of the universe isn't going to care much that we are ever here. If theism is true, um, death wouldn't be the end of life, at least in the major forms of theism. Um, Christianity and Islam both hold that uh, life continues forever. So, where am I going according to theism? As King David said, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Fifth, what am I worth? What am I worth according to atheism? I might be valuable to other people for a limited time. I might be valuable to future generations if I pass on my DNA to them. Um, otherwise, I'm, I'm not worth much. You quote Bill Nye, the science guy here. He said, as I learned more about evolution, I realized that from nature's point of view, you and I ain't such a big deal. Humans are just another species on this planet trying to make a go of it, trying to pass our genes into the future, just like chrysanthemums, muskrats, sea jellies, poison ivy, and bumblebees. What am I worth according to theism? On Christian theism, at least, I was worth enough for the creator of the universe to enter creation to pay a price for me. So, it sounds like a lot. Sixth, what's the point? And here I think we have the most obvious difference between uh, theism and atheism, and I think Kyle's going to agree with, with uh, some of this. With theism, we can talk about ultimate points, transcendent points, uh, eternal points. With atheism, we're limited to relative, local, temporary points. So if you're an atheist and you ask yourself, what's the point of doing X, you can answer the point of doing X is Y. The problem is that without any sort of ultimate point, you can always ask the follow-up question, what's the point of doing Y? Um, and after you answer the point of, of doing Y is doing Z, then you can ask again, what's the point of Z? And since there's no ultimate answer, you, you only have two options. The first option is to avoid asking these kinds of questions and to just go with your feelings about whatever you happen to find meaningful. So, I like X, so X is the meaning of life for me. Um, I should point out, though, that with, with this approach, you can replace 
x with anything, if it's just how you feel about these things. You can say, I like curb stomping old ladies, and it, I just find this incredibly meaningful in life. So that's the meaning of life for me. Um, if your meaning isn't grounded in anything outside of your feelings, then anything you feel is the meaning of life for you. The second option is to recognize that your feelings aren't a very solid foundation for meaning and to face the implications of your worldview. Here you'll have to conclude something that echoes the words of the great 20th century atheist Bertrand Russell, who said, Man is the product of causes which had no provision of the end they were achieving. His origin, his growth, his hopes and fears, his loves and his beliefs are but the outcome of accidental collocations of atoms. No fire, no heroism, no intensity of thought and feeling can preserve an individual life beyond the grave. All the labors of the ages, all the devotion, all the inspiration, all the noonday brightness of human genius are destined to extinction in the vast death of the solar system. And the whole temple of man's achievement must inevitably be buried beneath the debris of a universe in ruins. All these things, if not quite beyond dispute, are yet nearly so certain that no philosophy which rejects them can hope to stand. Only within the scaffolding of these truths, only on the firm foundation of unyielding despair, can the soul's habitation henceforth be safely built. So, given atheism, you can either stop the regress of meanings by saying this is just my meaning, don't ask why, or you can recognize that there's no end to the regress and therefore no foundation for meaning. Uh, if you'd like a third option, you'll need to abandon atheism and accept a worldview that offers another option. And if you'd like to take that route, I have a suggestion for you. <laughs> All right, thank you, Mr. Uh, Wood and uh, Mr. Jones, for giving your uh, thoughts. Uh, we're going to go to uh, rebuttals now. I do also just want to say, since I uh, notice a, a number of people uh, standing along the signs, uh, the sides of the room, uh, there are open chairs, and I'm sure people are friendly here. So if anyone wants to sit down, there are chairs available. Um, but with that in mind, though, uh, we're going to turn to rebuttals now, and the floor is open to Mr. Wood. Yeah, Mr. Jones. five minutes, I'll make this quick. Um, it's a very bleak picture of atheism you have there. Uh, <laughs> it's almost as if it's a caricature. Um, this is a problem of reduction. We're just a bunch of molecules. We're just atoms swirling around in an abyss. You know what? We're not just that. We are more than that. The experience of wonder, of art, of beauty, of literature, of life, of love, of truth, of value. A basic single atom does not experience that, but we do. So saying we're just an atom, it's hyperbole. You are more than an atom. I am more than an atom. Um, at least hope I am. Uh, now, if we talk about meaning, right? Things aren't meaningful unless there is a celestial big brother. Do you see how Orwellian that is? You don't need a cosmic dictator to have meaning at all. In fact, if it's only meaningful because there is this celestial being, then that is very, that's very problematic. Okay, let me give you a couple examples. If you have an eternal life, in infinite life, if, if death is actually just a chimera, if it's fate, like Jesus' death, it was just, whoop, dead for a little, pop back up, that's not real death. I believe in actual death. When you're dead, you're dead. There's no you. You're gone. Right? Now, imagine that's not the case. Imagine you go on forever. I'm sure you guys can all imagine a book that you enjoy. Just imagine a book that you and imagine it goes on forever. Will you enjoy that book? I bet you after a thousand or two thousand or three thousand pages, you're going to start hating that book. In fact, to be honest, if it goes on to millions of pages, 
it will be torture. You guys have all seen the third part of the Lord of the Rings, right? With like the 50 different endings? I knew life was meaningless after the second ending. <laughs> I mean, imagine that those endings just kept going. It would be torture. So, yes, the idea of not dying and having this momentary bleep in this otherwise expanse of celestial bodies may sound daunting or frightening. It is the precondition. You have to have it to experience and have true meaning. Otherwise, you basically have infinite boredom, infinite torture, or infinite any mixture of, or anywhere in between. I mean, it's not meaningful because there is an eternity. It's exactly, precisely meaningful because there is not. Your book ends. Your movie ends. And that, to me, is ultimately where meaning is bound up. It's bound up in finitude. And yes, it is scary. I've never died. I don't really want to die. I like living. Um, even in this bleak, horrible, horribly tragic Kafka scenario David's painted, um, I seem to be quite enjoying it. And I hope we can all ride this fiery spinning ball until it blows up. But that to me does not negate meaning. That is where meaning is bound up. It is not bound up in the dictates or existence of a celestial big brother. It is between me and you. Comrades doing the best we can <coughs> in this swirling abyss. Uh, so, um, God, I could, I could keep going on there. I felt like I was preaching. See, that's like the, the old youth pastor coming out of me. Uh, but I think death needs to be taken seriously. And I think the seriousness of death, the radical finitude that we have, that, like I said before, is where we're bound up in meaning. Uh, not where God sends himself on a suicide mission to, to die but not really die. Um, that doesn't sound like too much work for an infinite being, not to demote the care that uh, one might think that God has for them. But that will be the end of my rebuttal. Thank you very much. Alright, thank you Kyle. Thank you Kyle, and um, Mr. Wood, you have the floor. Alright, uh, Kyle says that I offer a bleak picture of atheism. Where did that picture come from? Richard Dawkins, Bill Nye the Science Guy, and Bertrand Russell. <laughs> so, the leading defenders of atheism in the modern world offer a bleak picture of atheism. That should say something about their view. Um, now, Kyle insists after this, he says, but, but we're more than that bleak picture. I agree. I agree completely that you're more than this picture. But it's because I reject your view that I think you're much more than the bleak picture picture presented by your chief representative. Um, and by the way, I'm not, I'm not just saying this as a Christian, I concluded that when I was uh, 16, 17 years old. So uh, that's exactly what I thought when I read the words of Richard Dawkins and so on, or Bill Nye the Science Guy, on this topic, I think, yeah, you're right. Now, by the way, sometimes they'll go on to say, but we have meaning anyway, and so on. But it's like, uh, well, you kind of got the, the implications of your worldview correct, but you still need to say, but we still have meaning because we at least recognize our place in the universe, whether uh, it's meaningful or not. Um, Kyle objects to the idea that life only matters because there's some sort of cosmic big brother. Um, well, that, that's not the position I, I'm arguing for. I'm saying here is a worldview, and here are the implications of that worldview as far as the meaning that we have. And here's another worldview, and here are the implications uh, on the meaning that we have given that worldview. And we look at them and we look at uh, we look where the implications are and we just draw up the comparisons and do so in an honest manner. It's pretty interesting that when they're both lined up, using even the words of champions of atheism, we go, oh my goodness, that's awful. Well again, that would that should say something about the uh, the views we're comparing. 
Um, Kyle said, would we, Kyle asked, would, would we enjoy a book that goes on forever? It's only meaningful if it has an ending. Look, let me be clear. I would love to spend forever with my wife, a person who annoys me frequently, and I annoy her. We get into ridiculous arguments over stupid things. And at the end of the day, I love her, right? I would, I would love to be around her forever. How much more the creator of the universe, right? So if we're talking about the bleak picture of atheism, I would say you have a pretty bleak picture of theism. If you say, I could know the creator of everything, time and eternity and everything else. I, I, I could know the creator. Uh, but, you know, a couple years and then I'll get bored. Um, I don't know. Maybe, maybe we, we experience it, we'll find out we don't get bored. If you experience the infinite, maybe the infinite isn't boring. Now, on the issue of the infinite God, Kyle asks, how could we comprehend an infinite God? Well, yeah, you can't fully get your mind around it, but it's like the concept of, in, uh, the concept of infinity. We understand what the concept of infinity is. Uh, by negation, it's, you know, the, beyond limits and so on. Um, you can't get your mind fully around it, but you can certainly understand something about the concept, and I would say that it's something similar about God. Obviously, you can't get your mind fully around God. Um, as for arguments for God's existence, um, Kyle brings up the, what would be the cosmological argument, and he says that he's content in being agnostic on where the universe came from. And I actually respect that position more than people who say, an atheist who say, this is how it happened. And, uh, you know, I'm, 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 I have more respect for saying I don't know than for this is how it happened than giving uh, an atheistic answer. But uh, I, I don't think it's, I, don't, I think it's remarkably easy to come to certain conclusions uh, on, on a topic like this, uh, mostly by just offering disjunctive syllogisms, which are, which are very, very simple reasoning. Um, either the universe has existed for all eternity, or it had a beginning. We know mathematically and philosophically and scientifically that the universe hasn't existed for all eternity. Conclusion, it had a beginning. Now that you know that it had a beginning, it either began to exist as a result of some cause or it's uncaused. Um, the idea of a universe coming into existence as a result of no cause would defy everything we know about reasoning, what science would go on the window and so on, so we have to conclude that the universe has a cause. If the universe has a cause, <coughs> Then, what are the characteristics of this cause? Well, time comes into existence with the universe, so it would have to be timeless. Matter comes into existence with the universe, so it would have to be immaterial. It would have to be powerful enough to create a universe out of nothing, sounding an awful lot like God, but with some very simple uh, reasoning. So, um, Kyle's content with agnosticism. I'm content with going with the dis disjunctive syllogism. All right, so that concludes the, uh, oh. I just got the uh, schedule mixed up in my head. Um, I had accidentally skipped forward to the break instead of the counter rebuttals, but um, yeah, so we're gonna start, be starting counter rebuttals now. Uh, Mr. Jones, you have the floor.
Neither of them are providing justifications for why that existed. So anyway, the idea of a God existing forever uh, is just as problematic for me as the idea of a universe existing forever. Now when uh, David was talking about how we can't wrap our heads around completely around the idea of infinity, I'm well in agreement with that. I think we're all in agreement. But it's interesting how very little we would actually know about the concept of infinity. Yeah, we have a very vague idea. It's infinity. I see the symbol. <laughs> That's about as far as my mind goes. If you can go <coughs> further than that, please let me know. Now, if we want to understand the bare, if we want to apply that to God, then if we can know this much about God, that's not much. That's not much at all. Um, Certainly not enough to warrant a belief, it's a concept, it's an idea, but assenting to it mentally, I'm not so sure. Now, um, when you're talking about Bertrand Russell and Richard Dawkins, and they paint this bleak picture, right, of, this, of the ultimate purpose, or lack thereof, of the cosmos. I'm in agreement. I don't think there's a nice golden thread that wraps everything together. I don't think uh, it's uh, a nice package. In fact, I think it's very tempting to wrap things up nicely like that. There's this ultimate meta-narrative, this story that has an ending, this Shakespearean play where at the end this happens and it wraps up the whole story. Um, life is more complicated, more difficult, and not as easy to understand as that is laid out. That takes a lot of, um, I would say, hubris to say not only do you know that uh, an infinite being exists, but that you know what this infinite being is like, that you describe this infinite being in human words that cannot apply to an infinite being, um, that, uh, that this world has this intrinsic value or meaning or story because of this infinite being, that requires a lot. That's a very high statement to say that you know that. I mean, I think people can believe it, but to know it, to have cognitive certainty, or at least some semblance of certainty about that, that's a very high statement and it needs high levels of justification that I don't think are provided. We were told it's so simple, it's almost like an eight-year-old can do these dis uh, disjunctive syllogisms and go, oh, there's the first cause. No. I mean, that's just simply not the case. Um, like I said, where does God come from? Now, uh, oh, I could go into all kinds of things. Um, I doubt that you'd want to spend forever with your wife. I don't know her. She's probably a lovely person, but I can guarantee you, you would not want to spend eternity with her. As you wouldn't want to spend eternity with anybody. And I love a lot of people. But spending eternity with them? My God, are you kidding me? That, that is unbelievable. That is worse than the Lord of the Rings movie. Because at least I can separate myself. You know, I... Click the off button. But there's no off button in eternity. And you have no choice to be there or not. Imagine that. You can't just, I don't think you can stop yourself or kill yourself in eternity. That would be an interesting idea, but I will end there. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Mr. Jones. Uh, Kyle, you, uh, Mr. Woody, you have the floor now. Now, Kyle compares me, quoting Richard Dawkins, to what it would be like for him to quote Fred Phelps of Westboro Baptist Church. I am fine with that comparison. I've been saying for years that Richard Dawkins and, and co. are the Westboro Baptist Church of atheism. So, well, now that we've cleared that up, I agree. There are, there are much better representatives of atheism. And just to be clear, there, there, are, there are atheists I have, I have a lot of respect for their intellectual ability. Massimo Piglucci, if you're in the room with him, that is the smartest guy in the room. And I usually feel like I'm the smartest guy in the room, so that is... That's, uh, <laughs> um, now, on the issue of where does God come from, why can't we say that God existed for... Why can we say that God existed forever, but not that the universe existed forever, the world existed forever. Well, it's because we know that the world hasn't existed forever, right? We know that the, the world is the kind of thing that had a beginning. 
If the world had existed forever, then you'd need a different sort of argument. And there are people like Thomas Aquinas and so on who dealt with the idea of, the, of an eternal universe. Um, but our universe had a beginning. So our universe is not the sort of thing that you can say, what if it existed forever? We know that it didn't. Um, so you either have an infinite regress of causes, or you have something that's eternal. Um, since time, according to the physicists and cosmologists, comes into existence with our universe, that would means something timeless. Here, like the concept of infinity, tricky to get our minds around, but that's where the syllogism leads. Um, he says, uh, what we know about God is very limited. That's true. If you're talking about God being infinite in, in, in attributes and so on, then correct. What we do know about God is very limited. But think about this. If God is infinite in all these ways, and our knowledge is limited, and we would learn a little bit about God at a time, it seems we could spend all eternity learning and always have more to learn. So um, maybe we don't get bored there. <laughs> Kyle says it's, it's humorous to say that we know about an infinite being who is described in human terms. Now, I, I, I have a problem here. Um, because Kyle objects to the idea that we could, how could we know about the infinite God? How could we know about something that's, that's infinite in these ways? And yet, God is off, we describe God in human terms. You know, such as God sees this, and God does that. God is jealous in, in these things. Um, but, but think about this. If God is infinite, we can't get our minds around God as he is, then God would have to, if God's describing himself or we're describing God, we have to use human terms, right? So it makes perfect sense to describe God in human terms, given that we are humans, and that's the best we can do. So, do we fully comprehend God? Absolutely not. Can we know some things about God? I would say yes. And when we're talking about uh, you know, God's reason and so on, the medieval theologians dealt with this a lot. They understand, hey, these, these concepts are used analogically. Um, they, they do not mean the same thing that they would mean in a human being, and yet these are the terms we have. So... Given the understanding that we have, we have to describe God in these terms. Um, Kyle says, I wouldn't want to spend eternity with my wife. Wrong! But I know it, because look, almost every person I ever meet annoys me after about half an hour. And three days, for someone I really like, three days is like, that's the top. That's the, I, I get out of my face, right? Um, my wife is the only exception. She's the only one that, that I'm around her like eight or ten hours a day and never got annoyed, never thought, hey, I don't want to be around this person anymore. So, uh, again, the, the, the point is, is not about, uh, you know, wives or friends or what we like or don't like here. The idea is, is it possible to really want to be around someone forever? Uh, if I can look at my wife and think, yes, then imagine the infinite God who I could spend all eternity getting to know I uh, certainly don't think that's, that we can rule out, uh, rule out theism simply because we think we'll get bored. Um, so that's about all I have on, on the, on the uh, regarding the issue of meaning. I think Kyle and I are, are in significant, significant agreement. He said in his opening statement that um, you know you don't have any, you don't have any, uh, uh, any ultimate meaning or transcendent meaning, something like that. Um, well, it, it's. I think we're, we're in agreement that, that you have a, a more limited kind of meaning. Again, as I said, I, I don't want to say that atheists have no, uh, no meaning, but in, in ultimate terms, um, this is a separate issue from whether theism is true or not. Just comparing the two, you have some amazing, some amazing things available in theism that you just don't have on atheism. The only point there would be you should think about these things very carefully, um, explore the arguments because they have some uh, amazing consequences. You can call me Kyle Wood if you like. <laughs> Did I say Kyle Wood? No, you said Kyle Wood. I miss you. Oh, <laughs> wow, that worked. <laughs> Reverse psychomology. Um, so, not that I want to defend Richard Dawkins, trust me. Actually, yeah. One second. Uh, for the uh, re-representing re the arguments, they both candidate, both debaters have ten minutes. I like the word candidate. I feel. I could do it someday. I'm too liberal for Arizona, though. I have to go to a different state. Calm, calm, calm down, Madam Secretary. 
<laughs> I'd go back to Massachusetts, where, where I belong. <laughs> no offense to Arizona people, We're I swear. Pretty good now, just so. Yeah, alright. I know uh, Angel here is going to help put taco trucks on every corner. Okay. Um, anyway, so, like, as I was going to say, I'm not a big fan of defending Richard Dawkins. Of course, there are some things I like um, that he says, and there's other bigoted, anti-feminist, Islamophobic junk that spews out of his mouth, so I don't really have a strong attachment to him. Um, but I certainly would have uh, believe in his approach to homosexuality as rather quite different from Fred Phelps. Uh, so, I don't think that would be a good analogy. Anyway, once again, not to defend Richard Dawkins, but... Uh, so, our universe, right? As you were saying, once again, I'm not an astrophysicist. Both of us just admitted we weren't scientists. Um, or more inclined to philosophy. But as you know, um, it is entirely possible that this universe came from others. That is not impossible. Um, you could have oscillating universes. You could have all kinds of different stuff that I feel um, inept and out of uh, tune in acting like I can describe. Um, but it's certainly not as simple as some punctiliar point uh, where a infinite being magically poofs the cosmos into existence. Um, not to be too reductive of creationism. Uh, now, you were talking about how, once again, we can't understand, wrap our head around this idea of infinity, but we can grasp some things, like about God. God may be infinite, but we can understand some things. Um, my argument goes further than that. My argument would be that in human cognition, in human language, you can't understand anything about God. That would be because, as with any infinity, it would infinitely transcend. It wouldn't just transcend a little bit, it would infinitely transcend. So imagine you're trying to understand the carrot while you're uh, running on one of those, uh, what are they called? See, this is how much I go to the gym. Uh, <laughs> one of those things that people go and run on. Uh, <laughs> treadmill, thank you very much. This is the treadmill analogy. You got the carrot dangling in front of you and you can never reach it because you're on the stupid treadmill. The treadmill just goes on infinitely. You're trying to grasp the carrot. You can never reach there. Right? So this isn't just about uh, that you can't know a lot about infinity. This is that you can barely know anything. Um, now, I think the same applies with God. Um, at least the concept of infinity doesn't have agency. It doesn't have personhood. Once again, David is talking about a God that thinks wills, and acts. A God that I believe under his view chooses sides, um, prefers a particular side in a battle, or a war, or amongst people. God, in this sense, would, I assume, prefer Christians or uh, to Muslims, or certainly to me. Um, now, this thinking, willing, and acting being that exists at a time once again, with human language, what do we mean when we say thinking? What, what is implied in thinking? Thinking implies that there is a point A where some thought originates and leads to a point B in time, discursively. But if you're outside of space and time, how do you think? How do you will? And how do you act? When you act, will and think, you do so in time. So you're, we're using words to describe uh, what people do in time to a being that exists outside of time. And you, that's, that's not even uh, an analogy that can be close. Once again, you're, you're trying to grasp a carrot you can faintly and barely see. Um, now, I don't even believe in a, in a God to exist to have a faint imagination of. I think that God is constructed. It's a human project to create and uh, project onto the cosmos an agency. We're notorious for this. Uh, not only do we want to see patterns, these are just anthropological facts, we want to see patterns. We see faces on the moon all the time. 
Um, I always see the funniest faces, but uh, we see uh, patterns where there may not be none. And there are, I believe, evolutionary reasons for that. But there's also agency that we project onto things. Um, and I think that we do that onto this idea of a god, and which, is, makes, which certainly makes sense when this god is a lot like us. Uh, David's talking about a very um, sort of bare-bones theism, right? He's not diving into his Christian faith. Uh, you mentioned Jesus once earlier, and you didn't even say Jesus by name. It's funny, in this debate, I'm the first person to say Jesus. <laughs> but um, this, uh, when we start breaking down more and more what uh, God you actually believe in, as opposed to just Aquinas' first cause, um, that would provide much fodder, I believe, um, not only of my criticism of uh, the recordings of Jesus or the uh, dubious circumstances under which this <laughs> supposed person existed and uh, performed miracles and was uh, raised from the dead, or interestingly enough raised himself from the dead, um, the critique of the Trinity is strong with this one. Uh, I do not believe that three can equal one. But, that's just about Christianity. And on the topic of Christianity, let's also imagine some other world religions, or some other faiths. Let's imagine Islam, or Judaism, or Zoroastrianism, or whatever. Imagine David's critique of them. Okay. What would the criticisms be? Well, it doesn't seem to be evidence for this God. This God seems to have uh, conflicting messages, or stories, or moral character. Um, this God is written about by ancient desert nomads that didn't know that uh, the earth revolved around the sun, didn't know what a germ was. Um, you know, so he would go, well, of course I'm not going to believe this, but it's interesting, because that's why I don't believe in his God. The same criticisms that he would have about any other of the thousands of gods that exist, or that are said to exist, is the same criticism that I would have of his God. I just go, and I hate to say this, I just go one God further. Um, that's all that we're doing here, that's all that I'm doing here, is I would use his logic against his God, or the God that he believes in. I feel that it's problematic when you have a standard for others that you do not have for yourself. And once again, God is always exempted from these rules, right? Uh, from nothing, nothing comes. You can't get something out of nothing. But God created the world out of nothing. How does that happen? Um, we would say it's wrong to kill or murder, and if I drown people, it would be immoral. But if God does it, it's not immoral. See, we're exempting God. We're exempting God from the criticisms we have of other gods. And to be consistent, I don't think we can do that. Um, now, uh, so touching on the in infinity problem, touching on the analogical language problem, touching on the issue of creationism and uh, what's called the outsider's test for faith. Um, I think I'm wrapping up here. I got like a minute left, right? One minute. Is that pretty good? Um, in conclusion, I think it's fairly uh, strong that, or uh, there's a strong. Uh, indication that not only do these 2,000, 3,000 other gods um, not exist, but I believe David's God certainly does not exist either. Um, we've been given a few um, syllogistic ideas about uh, God existing that I do not think can hold. Um, and uh, as far as human meaning <coughs> is concerned, it's exactly that. It's human. It's and I'm fine with that, and I think we should, we all should be. Thank you. All right, thank you, thank you Kyle. Hello, all right. Thank you, Kyle, and uh, Mr. Wood, uh, you have the floor now. I'm going to try and uh, bring some of these ideas together along the way here. Um, Kyle says that... Uh, one possibility is that our universe came uh, from other universes. So why do we say that it, it came from God? Well, these other universes, so this is called multiverse theory. Um, 
and you know the traditional idea is that the universe comes into existence, uh, and that's the beginning of space, matter, and time, and so on. Um, and the, the alternative to this, from the atheistic perspective, is that there's a series of other universes, possibly an infinite series of other universes, but these other universes, here's the problem, are still temporal, physical universes, and so you still are left with the kinds of things that have beginnings and so on, and so the argument just applies, only now you're dealing with an infinite number of universes to account for, and not just one. Um, now, I, I want to point out here, because this, this applies to several things, um, I, I lay this out as, as simple deductive, I mean, uh, um, disjunctive syllogisms, either A or B, it's not A, therefore it's B. This is the simplest type of reasoning we have. If we can't trust our reasoning with disjunctive syllogisms, I would say science goes out the door, everything goes out the door, we just can't trust our reasoning ability. If I can't know, hey, either the universe goes back forever or it has a beginning, we know that it doesn't go back forever, therefore it has a beginning, if I can't know, hey, if the universe came into existence, it either had a cause or it's uncaused, it's absurd to think there's no cause, therefore there's a cause, and then to go on through the attributes. If we can't do that kind of reasoning, I'm afraid we shouldn't be reasoning at all. And so the, the, I think the issue here is one of uh, our confidence in our faculties, and I think this would be um, another difference between theism and atheism, and here I'm talking about atheism in the strong sense of something like naturalism. I believe we're made for things like this, right? I believe we're made to be able to figure things like this out. So as a Christian, I believe we're created in the image of God, and that we're made to be able to figure out things like the, you know, the, the origin of the universe and so on. If I were a naturalist, then I would have to agree, yeah, we, 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 we're talking about the origin of the universe, what are you talking about? We're not made for that sort of thing. Uh, if we're talking about naturalism, we have to think how we got here, how do we get the faculties that we have, how would we get these faculties if naturalism is true? Well, um, natural selection only favors two things, survival and reproduction. Right? So whatever faculties we have, those faculties were selected because they helped us survive and reproduce. So if you're, if you're trying to assess the reliability of our reasoning ability, you'd have to say this was, a, this was an ability that was selected because it helped us survive and reproduce. It helped our ancestors survive and reproduce. We have this ability because our ancestors had an ability that helped them survive and reproduce, and so they ended up um, uh, leading to us over time. Now the problem is, if you say I have reliable reasoning ability, I have reliable cognitive faculties when it comes to things like finding food or finding mate, so things that are basically related to survival and reproduction, that's not the sort of faculty you can trust to tell you about the origins of universes or uh, things like God or something like that. You're not made for that sort of thing. So, at, at the end of the day, much like the implications with the question of meaning, that if you're a theist, you have a certain view of the meaning of life and so on. If, you have, uh, if you're an atheist, you have, you have limited resources uh, to, uh, when coming to your conclusions about meaning. The same is true of our ability, of, of our reasoning abilities and so on, that if you're a theist, again, you think, hey, I'm made to answer these big questions, I'm created in the image of God. If you're a naturalist, you have to think, my faculties came from uh, their ability to help my ancestors survive and reproduce, and coming to accurate conclusions about which berries to eat does not give you good grounds to think that you can figure out the, the origin of the universe or something like that. But, if that's the case, notice we have trouble dealing with some of these other issues. If our reasoning ability is in doubt, if we can't trust ourselves making disjunctive syllogisms, how do we then go on to make criticisms of God and say God should do this, God wouldn't do that, um, we can't know this, we can't know that? All of this is presupposing a naturalistic view of our faculty, which, to, to, to be clear, I think it's, it's, it's good that he's being consistent. It's good that he's being consistent in that sense of our not being able to understand the infinite. No, if we're not made for that sort of thing, then of course not. Again, as a theist, we are made to know God. So, um, now Kyle again says that um, God would be infinitely removed for us, so uh, we just can't know uh, much about God. 
Um, so, so here again, I'll, I'll say that that's, a, that's assuming a very low view of what we are. If the infinite creator made us to know him, and we have to grow in that knowledge, uh, are you saying that an infinite being cannot make us to understand him? I, we're starting off with the idea of an infinite being and what he could do. I would assume he can make us so that we can know something about him. Um, how can we know, this is an interesting point, how can we know or understand what it's like to think or act outside of time? Well, that's correct that we don't understand that, and theologians have been talking about that um, a lot longer than we've been around. Uh, so yes, this is the principle of analogy that, um, no, you can't fully grasp what it's like for God to think or God to act. You can only understand it analogically. Here's what it's like for us. Therefore, God's thinking is somehow analogical to us, but significantly different. Um, well, how can we say that God does think and God does act if we don't know what it's like to do that kind of thing from outside of time? Well, when we make, uh, when we make arguments and come to conclusions that there's no other option other than the conclusion, not being able to get our, our minds fully around the concept doesn't mean we can't come to conclusions. I have no idea what it would be like for um, something to be timeless or something to be um, immaterial. Um, but that's the conclusion you need. If matter and time come into existence with the universe, then the cause, which you have to have, is timeless and immaterial. So, just because I don't know what it's like to be um, timeless, which a, a two-dimensional being, if you could have a two-dimensional being, wouldn't understand what it's like to be three-dimensional, um, that doesn't mean that a, you know, if a two-dimensional creature could understand three dimen could get, uh, could think in this way, that he just couldn't form any conclusions. You can form a conclusion and say, this has to be the case because this is the only option left. Um, without being able to get your mind around it. So, here again, um, if we're left, if the syllogisms are syllogisms. If they're out the window, we can't trust ourselves on any reasoning. I think we can trust our reasoning, so we have to come to these conclusions. We come to the conclusions, maybe we don't get our minds fully around them, and that's, it's that way with lots of things, uh, not just outside of time and space or something like that. Even things that we are familiar with in our world, you can't get your mind fully around quantum mechanics. That doesn't mean you can't come to conclusions about quantum mechanics. Uh, you can't fully comprehend uh, relativity. It doesn't mean you can't come to conclusions about relativity. Um, Kyle says we project agency onto things, and you know we do the same thing with the idea of God. And it's of course we can do that. You know, if you see a storm or something, you can you know, say you know, some spirit is mad or something like that. You can do that. Um, you just have to watch when you're doing it and see when the evidence actually requires some agency or when there are other explanations. Um, on the issue of what, what would my criticisms of other religions be? Well, I actually approach other religions um, the same. Those of you who watch my videos, you know, uh, I, I can be brutal in, in criticisms and so on. Uh, but to be clear, there are only a few religions that even present themselves as testable. Most religions do not say, here is the true religion, and here's how you can know that it's true. Um, Islam is one, Christianity is another. Um, a lot of religions don't even make that claim about themselves. And um, I spent years examining Islam. I spent years examining Christianity. Um, and there is a, there's just a huge difference. It's not the topic of the debate tonight. But uh, at the end of the day, where Islam says, here's the evidence, you go to the evidence, and it's about the miraculous um, literary excellence of the Quran, and you find it's just not there. Um, the core claim of Christianity is you can know that Christianity is true because Jesus rose from the dead. You go there and you find out, again, all the evidence we have tells us this guy's dead. That was, a, that was public knowledge. And all the evidence we have tells us that he was alive again later, appearing to his followers and so on. Uh, so, um, I would say, I, I'm approaching them the same. I'm saying at the end of the day, what evidence do you have? You find it with one particular religion. You don't with others. That's why I'm a Christian. But regardless of all this, if we were just comparing these two ideologies in terms of the meaning, the implication on meaning. The atheism leads to a certain view of what we are and our purpose and so on. Theism, especially Christian theism, would lead to a different, very different picture. 
I'd say if you were just if you were if you were on the fence here, you'd have to go with one just because of the implications. When we add to the fact that we have very good evidence for the one where we also have the meaning, I'd say uh, pretty clear case.